Perfect. We're live now. Uh, thank you for joining uh, another episode of Cove Tenant Talks. Uh, very excited to welcome our guest today, uh, Gavin Willoughby. He's the business development manager at Applied Acoustics. Welcome, Gavin. Hi, well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, welcome to the UK and uh, welcome to uh, the Applied Acoustics headquarters. Fantastic. How are things in the UK? Uh, actually, not so bad. You know, we kind of... Uh, you know, getting uh, getting through the summer, and uh, it's been a little bit uh, different this summer, obviously for many reasons. But uh, actually, this coming weekend, things are going to be changing in a big way. So we're everyone's getting a little bit excited, and we can get out a bit more and start doing a bit more and being a bit more normal. Fantastic. Um, uh, usually, you're you're based here in Canada, but I know you uh, you're you're back in the UK. I think pr primarily for Oceanology International that was postponed. Um, but you're usually based here in Canada, correct? Well, that's right. And I did, you're actually right. I came back to the UK at the end of February to start preparing for uh, oceanology in London. Um, got caught up in all the pandemic and uh, decided to stay. It was easier to stay in the UK. Actually, I didn't really have an awful lot of choice, to be honest. I think they, the flights back to Canada stopped fairly, uh, fairly rapidly. Um, but yes, I came over to Canada in um, um, April, May of last year to set things up with, uh, with Co for Applied Acoustics and uh, spent most part of the year there. And uh, yeah, had some big plans for, uh, <laughs> for the summer in Nova Scotia, uh, which I have to put back a little bit. But um, that's, the, uh, yeah, that's the hand we're dealt at the moment, isn't it? Perfect. I'm sure you'll make the most of it when, uh, when you get a chance to, to get back here for sure. Well, yeah, I think, think and I'm hoping it's going to be fairly soon. Things are uh, starting to open up. The um, air routes are opening up and the quarantine restrictions are uh, subsiding a little bit. So I'm hoping I'll get to see a little bit of the summer, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, a little way to go just yet. Nice. Uh, what, what kind of the, what thought process did you have when you decide to, uh, to, to move some operations here to, to Canada? Well, um, it's kind of, it was kind of an amalgamation of uh, a, a lot of facets, really, Kyle. It, was, uh, it wasn't really a, a hard and fast plan to come to COVID. It was, uh, we, have a, we had a customer base in uh, Atlantic Canada for, for many years. I've been a regular visitor to uh, Newfoundland and to Nova Scotia for a lot of years. So I got to know the place, got to know a lot of people. Uh, one of the trips I did, somebody mentioned to me uh, this entity that was going to be Cove, uh, what it was going to be all about. Uh, and I thought it was kind of interesting. So I went down to have a, a look at the place. And this was about two years before the builders had moved in. And I saw this whole derelict bomb site. And I thought, yeah, right. Okay. Somebody's telling me some fibs here. Uh, and uh, so I parked that idea, never thought any more about it. Um, and then in the interim period, our business really was rocketing up in uh, in North America, throughout the US, uh, into Canada as well, doing a lot more in South America. And I was finding me personally spending more time on that side of the Atlantic. And I was crisscrossing the Atlantic several times a year, far too many times a year. I think there must be time to actually start having a bit more of a permanent presence in, uh, in North America somewhere. Um, there's a, quite a bit of... Uh, um, effort to go through to set something up in the US, which is where the bulk of our business is. But the links between Canada and the UK are very good. And I thought, well, that may be worth a look. And then COVID then sprang back into my mind. And I thought, okay, well, let's see if anything has actually happened. And, uh, and I came over and I met with some of the folk there and went down to, uh, to see what was happening. And it was a completely different concept. Everything was, um, the, the building was actually just being finished off the decorations the inside. Uh, I met with some people there. Some tenants had started to move in or started to sign up, certainly. Uh, some of which were customers of ours. Uh, and I thought, actually, yeah, this, is, uh, this, this could work out quite well. So, yeah, we put uh, uh, you know, an application in to uh, become a, a tenant at uh, a Cove. And like I say, we started up business there in May the 1st last year. And uh, it's, it's been a great move. And it's been uh, uh, an interesting place to be. I met a lot of good people. And it's something that we can we can grow and take further as the as the months and the years go forward. Nice, that's great to hear. And I know you work closely with a lot of uh, the tenants that are here as well. Mm, very, we, we we do. Yes, uh, I mean some were uh, customers prior to uh, to coming to uh, to Canada, 
Uh, some I've met uh, while I've been there, and there's some uh, collaborations going on, um, and uh, and not just in COVID itself, but in the wider the wider area, both in uh, 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 Newfoundland and uh, in Nova Scotia. That's great to hear. Um, really excited to to learn a little bit more about applied acoustics. So perhaps we can queue up your uh, presentation that you have ready to go. Yeah, I can do that. There's uh, I'm, uh, where are we? Hold on one second. My light. <laughs> Sorry, Kyle. <laughs> It's always easier. It's, it's always easier in the test run for some reason. It really is. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. I'm just going to shut that down for a second. And I'm going to come back to this. So uh, while we're doing this, I'll just a kind of a, an explanation of what you're about to see, hopefully at some point, is that uh, yeah, this is this is kind of a, a, a general company presentation. So there's quite a lot in there. So I'm going to kind of go through it fairly uh, quickly. I think the interesting part, at least from my limited knowledge of applied acoustics is, is really the, um, um, the, the variation of products that you guys have kind of a, a large portfolio, uh, kind of uh, addressing different markets. And uh, that must be an interesting uh, case in a especially from the business development side to um uh to, to promote these products and and really engage with kind of diverse select uh, group of customers well, it really is um we have a lot to offer lots of different industries and yeah so within uh, within canada atlantic canada we have industries there um the uh, defense with fisheries with ocean sciences uh oil and gas Right, are you seeing me now? Perfect, looks great. There we go, so, okay. So yeah, just to really run through this, and what I want to do as well is uh, kind of uh, not go too deeply into some of the, um, the technical aspects of this. As you say, we have a lot of products, uh, a lot of markets we service. And uh, so I'll try and run through as quickly as I can, because I'm very aware of, of time, and I know these things can linger on. So. Um, Applied Acoustics is actually part of a, a, a group of companies, which are the AE Technologies companies. And we have three, um, three groups, three companies within that group. Uh, Applied Acoustics being the one that most people have come across and aware of, uh, Inside Subsea Systems and Modulus Technology. And I'll run through all three of those uh, very briefly as we, as we go through. But I'll start with uh, uh, just kind of the group as a, as a whole as such. And 1989 is when we really, um, uh, we really started. Uh, which is when Applied Acoustics started. Uh, we're still privately owned and independent. The, the, the founders of the company are still uh, operating with us, uh, still 100% owners of the company. And these days, uh, we have about 50 employees on the site here in, uh, in Great Yarmouth, where I am. Uh, the three companies uh, occupy uh, one end of a, a larger business park. So we're all really closely together. And uh, I say, we're here all in one place with a 6,000 meters squared. So between the, uh, between the 50 employees, that gives us about 120 square meters each. So I think we invented social distancing before it became fashionable. <laughs> um, most people have never heard of Great Yarmouth. Uh, so I'll just show you very roughly where that is. If, you're, if, you're, if your knowledge of the UK you can picture a map, we're here, out here on the, uh, on the East Coast. Uh, on the North Sea. It's an old fishing port, uh, but it became it, it came to prominence in the offshore industry in the 60s and 70s when it became the really the center, the operating base for the uh, oil and gas fields in the Southern North Sea. Um, that has kind of faded off slightly now as we into the uh, 20, uh, 21st century. Um, but there was a number of companies here that built up uh, working in the offshore industry, uh, us being one of them, and we're still here and a few others still still occupy us, still occupy the town. Um, our North America sales office, as you said, is in Cove. We also have uh, service centers in, in the US, down in, in Houston, and one in, uh, in Singapore. And these are really places where people can send equipment for service and maintenance um, to our, our partner companies. 
So just to look at what Applied Acoustics does, our, our business really falls into two categories. We're a manufacturing company. We manufacture equipment. We don't carry out service work necessarily. So we're an engineering company designing and building equipment for various sectors of the, uh, of the uh, marine industry. So we fall into a geophysical survey and uh, acoustic positioning. And I'll look at both of those uh, separately. So our geophysical survey work it really is what's classed as shallow marine seismic reflection. There's lots of different ways of, survey, of surveying the seabed, depending on what you're trying to do and to achieve. What we do here comes under shallow marine. And what we have here is um, basically using sound sources to, uh, to look at what's in, in beneath the seabed. So we have a sound source, which we tow behind the back of a vessel. Uh, it's operated by these energy sources that are on board. And this is sending down um, sound pulses through the water, through the water column, through the sea floor, into the seabed, uh, through, the through the different layers. And those layers are reflecting the sound. They reflect the sound in different ways, at different intensities. And we can collect those uh, reflected signals and these hydrophones, send those back to the uh, vessel um, where they're processed. And then all being well, you'll end up with a, uh, a profile of uh, what's beneath the um, what's beneath the seabed. Uh, something a little bit like this. Um, this is from um, a customer of ours down in in uh, Panama Canal several years ago. Uh, this one, um, pretty shallow water at this point where they're working. This is like less than ten meters of water. Um, but then you see some um, layers going down into the seabed. Now, I'm no geologist. I really couldn't tell you what this means, but um, this data is passed on to the, uh, the, the geologists and they can uh, determine what's there, they can process it and then interpret the, um, what's, uh, what's beneath the seabed. Um, that's just an example of one of our sound sources off the, uh, uh, off the back of one of the boats. That's uh, what we call a sparker system. Um, and then this goes into deeper water. So this one here, again, another, another uh, profile of a uh, subseabed. Um, but this is over 2,000 meters of water off one of the, off the continental shelf in the, in the US. So what we're doing is we're really looking, uh, we, we really have the capability of uh, providing equipment to look at the different, uh, different, uh, different applications, different environments. Um, some of the, some of the uh, applications that people have. So people are studying the geology of the seabed for many different reasons. Uh, it, it could be uh, for the uh, economic zones, um, it's the, the general um, the geological survey. So in, in, in your part of the world, for instance, the uh, Geological Survey of Canada will be using our equipment for doing surveys and their counterparts in the US and the UK and all over the world. Uh, a lot of it into uh, oil and gas uh, environments, uh, a lot of universities, lots of, lots of academic research. But I guess in, in the most recent years, in the last 10 years or so, our biggest uh, client base, our biggest application is for offshore renewable energy and in particular uh, wind turbines. And um, just an example to a photograph of uh, some wind. So this is, well, this is uh, uh, an array that's just um, about two miles from where I'm sitting. It's just off of our coast, uh, our coast here. And we're using our systems here to uh, do the seabed studies uh, to determine the suitability of installing turbines and other structures, uh, looking at the integrity of the seabed, making sure or making sure these things aren't going to fall over generally. And that's also then we look at the surveys for cable routes coming back to the shore um, and uh, lots of other, uh, just, just to really get a general geological profile of these areas. Uh, this is very prevalent, started 10, 15 years ago in the UK and in Northern Europe. Um, Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, the UK were very, very heavily involved in the early days of offshore wind. And uh, we were there at the beginning and that expertise has allowed us to follow the spread of this industry. So now there's a huge amount of work going on in the US, particularly down the east coast of the US. There's a lot in Asia, uh, in particular China, the coast of Vietnam, Taiwan, Korea, Japan. All these countries are now really developing and investing heavily in, uh, in offshore wind. Whether that's going to make its way up to Canada, I hope so. Whether it will, I guess that remains to, uh, to be seen. There's lots of other sources of, uh, of energy, uh, renewable or otherwise. So that's really the, the kind of the geological aspect of, uh, of our business. Uh, the other side of it, 
uh, is our acoustic positioning. And in particular, it's uh, subsea tracking, USBL. Um, a USBL system is, is an acronym, uh, ultra short baseline, which again, I won't, uh, forgive me, I won't go into, uh, into the uh, technicalities of it, but please feel free to uh, email me or call me if you want some, uh, some questions answering at any time. And this is really a, a, a basic uh, way of monitoring your assets, your targets, whatever you might have in the water, be it a vehicle or a diver. And it's a, 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 a one box system, if you like, that you can uh, deploy from a vessel and know, um, uh, know where your targets are. So as, a, as, a, uh, as an indicator here, um, what we have, so the Easy Track is, a, is an old brand name uh, of ours. Um, so that's kind of the Easy Track system. This would be installed on a vessel. Uh, we have a single transducer deployed uh, through the water that just goes down into the water by a meter, a meter or two. And this is sending out an acoustic signal. Uh, and in this case, we've got an ROV down here. So we might have an acoustic beacon on the ROV. So this is sending down its signal. The beacon listens, hears the signal. It's waiting for a signal. It hears it uh, and then it replies. And then the transducer picks up that signal and calculates really that it knows the um, it knows the speed of sound in the water, it knows the angles of the direction it's going to and from, uh, and it's basically calculating a time it sent a signal to a time to receive a signal. And then from that, it can calculate its position. It can feed it into a GPS to give it a, a GPS lat long position. And then what you see on your display screen when you've done that um, is something like this. This is one of our systems here. We've got a chart overlaid on it in this, uh, in this instance. But down here, there's all your information uh, giving the latin long positions, depth, uh, slant range, heading, bearing. There's a lot of information it can give you about where your target is. And if that's moving around, it's updating all the time, you can set this to update very, very rapidly. So you get a constant record of your target in the water. And that might be a diver. Uh, we do a lot with divers. That's a, quite a common uh, application we're involved with. Uh, commercial divers uh, working in the oil and gas fields, naval divers. You can see on here, this chap has got his acoustic beacon on his uh, tanks at the back here. Uh, or we're using divers to go down and place transponders on the seabeds, on pipelines, on marking shipwrecks. Um. Yeah, but now, a quick question from the audience while we're just on this slide. Yeah, sure. Um, this is like an independent device, so it has its own power source. Uh, it doesn't have to be connected to the, the, the main system. It's, it's, it can do both, actually. So um, uh, they, they work off their own battery packs. Um, which will run for, um, well, depending on how often it's using for several, several hours, um, days, in fact, if it's just, uh, if the beacons are down listening, or you can couple it up to, uh, to, to take power from the, um, the systems you're using. So it's quite flexible in that respect. You can, you, you can, uh, configure it either way. Uh, this one here, we've got one of our, uh, one of our beacons onto an ROV down here, um, and we can also integrate into other systems. Uh, this is one of our deep toe geological survey systems. We've uh, incorporated a uh, tracking transducer into the uh, into the nose cone of there. And so anybody really that's working in the water, um, that's got equipment in the water, that's got people, that's got assets in the water, and they want to keep a record of where they are for, for whatever reason, with safety more than anything perhaps, um, many, many applications. We work with all sorts of people and we're finding new applications all the time, or at least our customers are coming to us and uh, asking if we can get involved. And, you know, so it's, a, it's very interesting. It's not just fixed in, uh, in, one, uh, in one area. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's you know, the, the actual groups of people. It might be oil and gas people inspecting pipelines. Uh, we do a lot with the universities and research institutes, um, civil defense, the, the police divers, the Coast Guard. Anybody that's working in the water, there, there will be at some point an application for uh, tracking your, uh, your assets. And then the other part of that is uh, we have an acoustic release transponder. It's a very similar type of device, really, only at the other end, it has a, 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 a holding device, which can actually connect onto a piece of equipment and, and hold it in place or just couple it up to it. And then this is deployed. And then at some point in the future, you can release this, you can command this to, to open the release and it will all flow back to the surface. And this is quite a common way of retrieving instrumentation, data loggers, uh, fishing pots, I guess, in, 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 some, um, in some applications. 
Um, and then we're also reconfiguring some of these to uh, operate uh, actuators and subsea valves. And, um, so again, many, many applications that we can, that we can uh, deal with. And then I'm gonna move on to one of our other companies. So Ensign Subsea Systems, this is a, um, uh, a defense company really. And what Ensign is doing is taking the technology that Applied Acoustics uh, develops for the commercial world and militarizing it. Um, the, the, the defense world has very similar applications, but works in a very, very different way in terms of the um, equipment requirements, the manufacturing processes, the uh, administration, the contract management. And we started uh, in defense quite a long time ago in, in sort of the early 2000s. And it became apparent that it was better to split the, um, split the companies and actually uh, create a dedicated uh, defense contractor uh, just because it was such a different, uh, a different way of working. Our, um, our commercial arm, uh, Applied Acoustics, you know, worked very, very quickly uh, with the oil and gas industry. Sometimes it's a matter of just, you know, as soon as the tide turns, it's time to move with with defense, it can be a much, uh, a much slower, um, uh, much slower process, uh, although a lot more uh, uh, burdensome in, in, in some of the contract management and the administration. So that's really the reason we, we split the companies. Most of our defense work comes under MCM, my countermeasures. So we're really out there helping uh, Navy groups look for mines uh, and other threats uh, and, and to destroy those mines as well. There's, um, um, in, hopefully it's, it's relatively, you know, relatively peaceful these days, you'd like to think in terms of who's deploying mines, not many people I would hope, um, but left over from various conflicts in the past, uh, particularly in, uh, in, in the UK and in Europe, um, tens of thousands of sea mines left over from, from world wars uh, they're out there causing threats to, uh, to commercial shipping. And um, there's, there's an ongoing program of mine clearance work. Um, so that's really, that, that's our biggest, uh, our, our, our biggest application within the defense market is working with navies, carrying out MCM operations who are using uh, towed arrays for searching and uh, ROVs and other vehicles for uh, disposing of those mines. Um, photograph I've got here of uh, one of our, actually one of our cove tenants. Uh, we work closely with uh, with, uh, with Kraken, and we've got uh, one of our uh, transducers uh, integrated into the uh, into their vehicles. Um, so this is so the application that how this works then is their their sonars and other people's sonars are going out there searching for these mines, using our uh, tracking systems to uh, record the uh, locations, and then. If it's determined that that is a, a, a target that needs to be um, inspected and maybe destroyed, then uh, we can send an ROV to that using our, our tracking coordinates and tracking systems on the ROV can go out to the mine and safely dispose of it. So as I said, we were back, back in the 2000s when we first started. Uh, our first um, success really in defence came with the Danish Navy uh, and they, they had an ROV programme, some, some double eagle ROVs. That was really commercial uh, commercial systems, but it gave us a very good insight into the requirements of defense and uh, how we needed to kind of change our products uh, our products to better suit that uh, that market. Um, late in 2007, 2008, we first made our first uh, bespoke military systems for the Royal Navy here in the UK. And we kitted out all of the uh, Hunt and Sandown class uh, mine countermeasures vessels and they, they were using a, a different type of ROV for their, uh, for their mine, uh, mine uh, neutralization program and integrate our systems into those. Uh, that brought us to the attention of uh, NATO and the other countries in NATO. Uh, and then we got very closely in with, the, with the US Navy, um, installing uh, systems onto their vessels. Uh, they also had a very interesting uh, airborne uh, system too, this, uh, the AMS, Airborne Mine Neutralization Systems where they're using helicopters to deploy the ROVs and uh, putting out tracking systems at the end of some very long cables. So that's another way of, of, uh, of uh, uh, extinguishing the, the threat there. 
and then uh, the Japanese Navy, we, uh, we would have some protracted talks with those guys. They wanted a lot of portable systems for their search and rescue teams. A lot of this came after there was a big, uh, a big earthquake they had in the tsunami um, and caused a lot of problems around all the islands in Japan. And so we uh, teamed up with the Japanese Navy and uh, they uh, gave us a contract for uh, a large number of uh, portable systems. And then this year, just as the, um, the pandemic broke, um, we received a, an order from one of our Asian clients, um, which turned out to be our 35th country that we've worked with in terms of uh, defense. Um, as you can see on this map, this is, uh, these are the countries that we're working with uh, continuously in our, uh, in, uh, in our defense uh, group. So supplying naval systems to all these countries. So something we're very proud of, it was a, uh, uh, it, it's actually become a huge part of the, uh, the applied acoustics uh, business, um, almost matching what applied acoustics does in, uh, in percentage terms. And so lastly, uh, very briefly, Modulus Technology is the, other, is the third uh, company in the group. It's an engineering house. It's, uh, uh, we, it's something that we created um, with our in-house engineers. Uh, I guess around about 2008, that kind of time, there was the big financial crash. Um, and people were coming to us for some bespoke work, uh, things they couldn't find on the rental market. And uh, it wasn't, it, we start off by kind of almost being quite dismissive and saying, no, actually that's not really work we can undertake. But, but within the group, you know, we have mechanical engineers and electronic engineers and software and cab facilities, and we have everything we need actually to do all this work um, uh, that we were being requested to do. And it just actually kind of needed a bit of a shift in our, in our mindset to take on some of these other projects. And so we started to do that and then that kind of took on a little bit of a life of its own, uh, in, enough there to, uh, to, create a, um, to create a small company, which now has actually grown. Um, so it's doing some bespoke projects, uh, not necessarily um, subsea, um, but it's also doing some prototype work for us. And it's uh, sometimes some of those products then become products that we move across to apply to so they become a, a, a standard brand and one of those products here is our mini pod submersible gps um, it's not submersible it doesn't actually work underwater the gps but what we've done here is uh, to create some very robust shock mounted uh, gps antennas and this was really for uh, the offshore deep seismic uh, survey guys they put these very long streams out the back of boats on uh, the tow along the surface uh, that need to be positioned. You need to have the positions of the streamers relative to the vessel, uh, relative to each other, to uh, to get uh, very precise georeferencing of the of the streamers. Um, but those things get battered. You know, these are they're in very harsh conditions. So um, what we were doing is, is buying the GPS boards and really just building them into our own uh, our own package, um, so they can start communicating with each other and with uh, with the vessel. And um, that, that's kind of then led on to a, a range of these products. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's just really one example of, of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a bespoke request that turned into a product that Applied Acoustics now sells. So that's really it. Um, I'll leave up that contact uh, page there so that you can see uh, uh, my email address there. If you have any um, questions or uh, comments or is there anything you need to know, please feel free to get in touch at any time. That's great. Thank you very much, Gavin. That's uh, uh, an interesting history too, especially uh, the company's older than I am and, uh, <laughs> and uh, have gone into this kind of this, this broad reach, but also uh, still very specialized in these the certain areas. I'm sure a lot of the listeners are, are kind of jealous that you're working with, have worked with 35 different navies around the world. I'm sure. Uh, it is. And it's, and it's still, uh, and it's still growing. And what's actually nice about the, about the country and you mentioned about the history is, so I joined the company, uh, it was oh, almost 17 years ago. And, and at the time, I think we had about uh, 15 employees then. And I'm proud to say that most of those are still, uh, still working here. You know, we have a very, very uh, high uh, staff retention here. Um, and that, that longevity and that continuity uh, really is great for building up relationships with our, with our customer base. Um, and so I'm proud that we, we're doing that. And even, and even those that are coming after us, we, still staying for long periods of time. We have a very, very low, uh, low, low staff turnover here. 
uh, uh, building off that question about uh, the Beacon being uh, independently powered, um, mm-hmm. so, someone had mentioned, uh, can it be used um, as a, rec- a recovery tool? So say if you lose communication with your, with your uh, traditional modem and uh, communication tools for an AUV, for instance, mm-hmm. uh, c- could you help uh, use your Beacon to help kind of recover those, those expensive assets? Absolutely, yeah, that's actually a, 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 a kind of a, a very common application. And actually, if you remember, um, when we were looking at some of the, um, the work we'd done in defence, our, uh, uh, our very first job with the Danish Navy and their ROVs, that came about. Um, it, was a, it was probably one of the very first defence events I went to. We got talking to these guys and they just lost an ROV. And it was like a million dollar ROV, one of the very expensive uh, uh, mine hunting vehicles. Uh, no, actually, no tracking capability, no, no, nothing on it at all. It was lost. It was gone. And this guy said to me, he said, so if I'd have had that on there, I could have gone back to it and I could have found it. And I said, yes, it had one of our beacons on there just on a, in listening mode. You'd have had about two months to go and recover it. And he said, wow, okay. In that case, we need to buy some of these. So that's absolutely the, uh, the application in, uh, that was used in that, in that respect. I'm sure that trend is kind of uh, as... AUV uh, uh, penetration in the market on the commercial side is rapidly increasing. I'm sure the uh, the business for uh, those beacons is, is increasing as well. Well, it is. Uh, there's a there's an awful lot of uh, autonomous vehicles out there now, and new manufacturers coming online all the time. And what's nice is one of the things that we we can do is we uh, provide a lot of OEM uh, support and products. Um, so we built you know so we can provide complete packages, complete beacons. Uh, or we can just provide transducers and board sets and people can build these into their vehicles. And so, yes, a number of the, um, of the AUV manufacturers uh, do buy a lot of equipment from us to build into their vehicles for that, for that very reason. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's easier to have that insurance plan than to buy another vehicle. <laughs> mm, absolutely. Well, it's, it's very true. I'm told it reduces the insurance premiums immensely. <laughs> and the data that uh, you may lose is, is super, probably almost just as important as the vehicle. Well, that's, a, that's pretty critical, actually. Um, particularly if you're with, you know, with, with uh, AUVs um, that are out there collecting data. Um, if you lose your vehicle, okay, that's one side of it, but you've lost months and months of data. Um, and that's, that's the critical component, I guess. For sure, especially if you look on the defense side, those uh, that data collected may be a, a valuable intelligence uh, piece. Well, right, that's 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 also very true. Um, yes, you don't really need one that getting into somebody else's hands. Perfect. So, um, in a general sense, uh, outside of AUVs and, and beacons, is there is there certain trends across the different sectors you work in that are particularly interesting or you've noticed? Um, of, of, the, of the current areas we work, yeah, it's very interesting. So going back to offshore uh, renewable energy, um, it, it was when we first started getting involved in offshore wind, it was kind of a kind of a slow developer. Um, new uh, um, the new markets there were you know, the UK, Germany, it was uh, Denmark, and for a while they were the only people kind of really investing in. It. And now that that's really exploded. Um, and that is a, 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 a huge growth area uh, for the industry in general and, and for us specifically. Um, I think because we got involved very early on, our products are known and accepted um, by the, the geological uh, survey groups. Um, but for us, that, actually, that industry also brings other um, applications to it as well. Um, particularly here in the, in, the, in the North Sea, um, there's a lot of unexploded uh, ordnance left over from from the war. Uh, I'm sure there's other places too, but there seems to be an awful lot down here in the North Sea. And so before all these surveys can take place, unexploded ordnance surveys have to happen, which people generally use with, with magnetometers. Uh, and our USBL tracking systems, they're used to position uh, and to log the, log the um, positions of those. So that industry, uh, even though we kind of got into that from a geological perspective, that's actually gone off in all sorts of other directions for our other products um, and other things that we're kind of um, developing that can be used there too. Um, on, on the flip side of that, the oil and gas industry, which for 15 years or so was kind of our bread and butter industry, that's, that's really tailed off. You know, we're not seeing so much uh, work in the oil and gas industry anymore. Um, the move to renewable has changed that. Uh, oil pricing going up and down is a, is a big factor. It's very low at the moment because of lack of demand. So um, the oil and gas industry is something we 
almost kind of left behind uh, several years back. And, uh, you know, thankfully we're involved in all these other, other markets, uh, but that's one that really has gone the, uh, the other direction. Interesting. So uh, we have uh, one final question here, uh, cognizant of time. Uh, someone for our local listener from Halifax is really interested in uh, understanding a little bit more uh, around uh, what the ocean ecosystem here in Halifax has allowed you to do that you might not have otherwise been able to do elsewhere. Um, the, uh, the ocean ecosystem, DJ. Sorry, I didn't quite... I... Exactly, yeah. So kind of the community. Well, it's uh, actually, it's, it's, it's interesting. So I guess Halifax in, in particular um, has, has grown up around the sea. I mean, the industry, there's a lot of industry all related to the ocean. Um, and it's something that's always uh, interested me and fascinated me. Um, but to have all these um, all these companies, all these groups of people in, in one area, all kind of collaborating in different areas. Um, the schools in Halifax are all teaching the, uh, the, um, the subjects that are required to, to serve as industry as well. So um, I mean, from our perspective, things like ocean acoustics and digital uh, signal processing, which is difficult to find here in the, in the UK. Some of the, uh, the, the universities and schools here are not teaching uh, the subjects that we need as a manufacturing company and an engineering company to help us grow. What I see happening in, uh, in, in Halifax is that you have that infrastructure there. You have the, uh, the groups of people that are learning the right, uh, the right, the right trays, um, learning about the ocean, learning about the, um, the processes involved. Um, and then you've got the engineering companies and then once you can put all this together, you have a really fantastic community uh, based around ocean technology, and that's really something that I'm I'm very drawn to, personally, um, uh, as well as the as well as the company. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, so, Kevin, it's been a it's been a pleasure chatting with you, and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing you when you come back to Halifax, and uh, hopefully that's sooner rather than later. Well, yeah, thanks, Kyle, and thanks for uh, thanks for having me on for the talk, and uh, uh, for those guys who have. Uh, stuck with it and listened uh, we've gone over time a bit so uh, apologies for that but appreciate you guys staying on board and yeah i'm very much looking getting back to halifax as soon as i possibly can um in the meantime i know it's a uh, uh, canada day uh, for you guys tomorrow so happy birthday canada have a good time uh, everybody and uh, i shall raise a glass for you from uh, from three thousand miles away <laughs> perfect thanks again gavin and uh, thanks everyone for for listening uh, uh if you're watching uh the replay uh please go to coveocean.com slash events for future tenant talks and uh, the ocean connector coming up in, in July should be very interesting as well. So thank you very much, Gavin. And uh, this has been a lot of fun.